I'll, I'll go now, Dave. You won't spotlight me. If we can bring Will on and just give a huge Harmonica UK welcome to Will Gallison from New York City. So, Will, welcome to Harmonica UK. We've been doing these um, chromatic sessions and we are very, very um, um, in love with Zoom because it enables us to have the likes of you over here. So, oh, you... Will, over to you. Well, hello and thank you for that gracious uh, introduction. Um, yeah, you know, living in New York City uh, is kind of where things are happening and um, I mean, musically in many ways. And uh, so I had the opportunity to play with a lot of people. Um, yes, Donald Fagan. I mean, I'm happy to talk about that now, if you like. That was very interesting because I expected I was going to go to a studio on the level of uh, RCA or something like that. And it turns out I, he gave me an address and I, I went to um, the address and it was a brownstone. And I thought, I've never seen this studio before. And I rang the bell and it was in the basement. Donald was very nice, very gracious. He had his dachshund there. And, um, but we, you know, we did a number of takes as people do. Um, I love that album and I'm pleased with what I played, but I think a lot of uh, harmonica players, especially ones who are doing professional studio work, I'm sure they can appreciate this. Very often you do a, a, a session and you think it sounds great because there's a great mic and it's a great system and everything. And then you hear the record and you think, what were they thinking? You know, the, the harmonica is distant and kind of small. And I, I was I was a little uh, disappointed about that when it came out. But um, what, what was the name of the track that you recorded from that album? I'm not the same without you, yeah. It's a great solo. It sounds amazing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny because I'm sure that when I when we played when I played it I asked him for reverb so there was reverb when I heard it yeah uh, and I had a big sound because I remember thinking that's a good sound mm. um, but you just never know what people are going to do with yeah you put it out there and then off it goes yeah yeah, yeah. your gonna, favorite thing I'm going to confess to you all I've just been in Costa Rica for 14 15 months and I hardly touched the harmonica when I was there I did a couple of sessions remotely for people. Uh, I started playing the soprano sax and got really into that um, and played some guitar. Um, so I'm a little nervous right now because I'm, I may not be up to, uh, you know, where I was before Costa Rica. But um, I practice fundamentals, I, you know, I think. Uh, and, I, and I also, I'll tell you what I do. I, I, I use the, the program and I believe me, I'm, uh, I'm not paid for by them, but it sounds like I am. Uh, iReal Pro, which I'm sure you know, which is, uh, for anybody listening, indispensable, I think, for anybody trying to learn jazz. I wish I had had that when I was 18 and not, you know, it came in a few years ago. Um, but that is a pro program I'll talk about some more because I'm going to use it in the presentation. But it's basically like a band in the box kind of a thing. And you can generate a background track for any song. And they've got pretty much every song ever written that you can access. Um, and it gives you a chart and it can play the song at any tempo, in any style, mm -hmm. and in any key. So for a while I was playing Giant Steps as a medium bossa nova, which I think is a wonderful way to play it. Everybody plays it so fast that you don't get to really appreciate the lovely chords, you know, but something like that. Plus I can't play it fast, but besides for that, it was fun playing it medium. And, uh... I use that a lot. And I also use a, a program called Drum Beats, but there are many other ones you can get, which is just a whole lot of very well sampled drum rhythms, you know, uh, people, I guess they're, you know, uh, and the loops, I suppose, they keep going. And right. it's so much more fun and engaging uh, to play scales, arpeggios, whatever, whatever you like. Uh, with a grooving funk beat or a bossa nova beat or a samba or something else than um, just to use a click, 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 click of, a, of yeah. a metronome. So I recommend that to everybody. That's, That's a really good point. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Great teaching point. Will, I noticed when we were chatting just before that you had a uh, chord chart of body and soul. Yes. Could you teach us how to play it from scratch? 
You know, I'm going to do a whole segment on that. Oh, oh, oh okay. Yeah. If you want I've to got... do that yet, or shall we ta shall we have some more questions? I have um, sure. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about uh, the video which shows you with the group of players. Um, could you talk about, you know, the video that Roger made just before oh. you started? I, I, I don't know if you saw that, but oh, it's filmed in 2007. Right, You'll have to find a way to show it, but it shows you. Um, I'm afraid I'm ignorant about this bunch of guys sitting, playing along to a Jamie Abersold track, playing Satin Doll. And everyone's okay. taking a solo in turn. Yeah. Could you talk to us a bit about that? It's this incredible yeah. group of people. It was a very formative experience in my life and in my harmonica life. Uh, I met Charlie Layton uh, when I was playing on the street with a guitar player, which I did throughout my 20s. That was where I think I actually got to know the harmonica by doing that. Um, and I was playing... <laughs> Funnily enough, it sounds like a joke, but I was playing in front of Carnegie Hall because <laughs> it just happened to be a good spot to play. And this very elegant man, uh, very well dressed, very well uh, groomed uh, fellow uh, walked by, probably the same age I am now, which is frightening, but he looked a bit older and more distinguished. And he, uh, he said, oh, you sound very good. He, he said, this is my card. He just gave me his card and said, Charlie Layton, recording engineer or something like that. It was probably, at that time, he had a recording studio. And uh, uh, so I thought, okay, that's interesting. I'll call him. I thought maybe he had a, a gig for me or, or, or a recording session. I called him and he said, hey, I have a, I get together with harmonica players every uh, Tuesday. And would you, would you like to come? I said, sure. It was on 58th Street and uh, just east of 6th Avenue. And I went up there and I continued going up there, I would say 90% of the Tuesdays uh, for the next 22 years or so. It was a long running experience. And uh, some of the people that were there, there was a fellow named Charles Franklin who was there pretty regularly. And he, he, he was a an ear player, but a, a very, uh, a beautiful melody player, which is what actually this little talk is, is going to be about, how to play melodies. You know, nothing fancy. He just played the stuff beautifully and correctly uh, with great phrasing and great tone. And uh, Charlie Layton, who is one of the great masters, I'll play a little bit of him later, uh, probably the most refined sound of anybody ever played the harmonica. The chromatic um and um there was uh, stan silverstone who was another player um blackie shackner used to come by who was played on thousands of records and movies um stan harper who was a phenomenal player not so much a jazz player but he played all the classics and he was technically one of the greats i think um and a wonderful cranky but terrific and big-hearted human being. So uh, I'm sure I'm leaving out some important people, but uh, eventually uh, uh, Rob Paparazzi came by a, a number of times. Um, uh, even uh, Gregoire came by a couple of times, Gregoire Murray. So it was just a harmonica hang, you know, and it was every, um, every Tuesday for about, three or four hours, you know, and we would, he, at, we, at the beginning, it was the days of LPs and he would play a, a Jamie Abrams old LP and we just let it run from beginning to end and we each very democratic, just everybody would take one solo and then the next and the next and the next. And uh, Randy Weinstein joined us uh, maybe eight or nine years into it. He moved to New York and that was great. And uh, so everybody was learning from each other. Mm -hmm. And, and that was a big part of my uh, training, if you will. Great. Well, I just want to check. Um, I've got loads of questions. I'm sure there's more. Um, I also want to take this um, moment to, to remind everyone that uh, please donate to the festival. There's a, there's a PayPal pay button 
Um, I did this before, and you get a very good fee for this. I can promise you will, because people are really generous, and it's shared out amongst all of us. And it's a, it's a really good system. So um, for those of you who are there, please do donate. I think Ben Reese has just put the PayPal button up in the chat. And the other thing, um, I can ask you millions of questions, Will, but I just want to make sure that you have time to present what you're doing and do some playing. Because uh, I'm sure people is... want to hear you play and, okay. you know. The time limitations is, o is only on you. I've got yeah. in... Uh... After this, I'm going to go visit my 90-year-old father for Father's Day. Right. But, but it's only uh, mm -hmm. 2 o'clock in the afternoon here, so I, I've got time. Mm -hmm. would, you, uh, would you perhaps show us a few, like, basic exercises that you reckon everybody might do, whether they're very experienced or just starting on the chromatic? Ooh. Could you show us a few now, perhaps? I'm just trying to think what that would be because certainly a, a beginner is going to practice things differently i'll show you one one thing that i i find is useful maybe this is a not the first thing one would think of but um when i'm warming up uh i want to get my lungs and my uh, diaphragm kind of loosened up because i notice when i'm playing well i can feel my belly going in and out um when i'm uptight i can still play but it's 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 not as fluid and um so one thing i do is a, is an uh an uh, augmented what do you call it a whole scale uh a whole tone scale starting on c mm -hmm. and the, the interesting thing about that scale there are two of them there's one that starts on c and one that starts on c sharp and they're all and a whole tone scale means you go up one whole tone. So C, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, if you will, or B flat, and then C. It's a six note scale instead of a seven note scale, most of uh, And uh, because mo all the other scales have a half step, or at least one half step in there, so you, you can fit more notes. But uh, what's nice about this is that uh, when you start on C, it's blow, draw, blow, draw, blow, draw, blow, draw, blow. <laughs> and oh, maybe I went to too many blow draws, but it's it's alternating blow, draw. And you can do it in two octaves. So mm -hmm. I'm going to move this mic here because it gives me a little reverb and yeah. makes me happier. So... I'm not warmed up, but that's that's mm. the idea. So right. slow will be. Right. Um, it's a nice little thing to get you to get you started and start out real slow. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't uh, just to save time. I didn't do it that slow, but um, mm. you, you uh, some of these. Um, Programs have actually you can inc increment the, the the oh you can, what, what, one way to do it is to put on a, um, a rhythm track and play it first just eighth notes or mm -hmm. quarter notes even mm -hmm. and then do eighth notes and then sixteenth. Uh, where you go farther up that that mm -hmm. way, so I know. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's one little thing. But I think playing uh, arpeggios is really important. But again, that would be more for more advanced players. And I do that with tongue switching. So that it, that helps me with my tongue switching uh, in the key right. of C. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> So I'm playing uh, major scale, major triads. I'm not major, yeah, okay. uh, diatonic triads up and down. Mm -hmm. And do that in every key. And that right, that's good yeah. for tongue switching because generally there's uh, there's a third and there's a fourth in that pattern. And the fourth generally or often you need to play with a uh, 
a tongue, you don't need to, but you can do mm -hmm. the tongue switch. And in some of the major thirds, for example, in B flat to a D, B flat to a D, the third um, is, uh, uh, I mean, well, there's two thirds and a, and a fourth. So you B flat to D is a great tongue switch, very mm -hmm. useful. Partly because when you don't tongue switch playing from a B flat to a D, you go through that double C. And um, so it's, it's a bigger physical jump. It's, they're skipping a hole when you do that. When you go from the D to the F, which is the third and the fifth of the B flat, uh, you're just skipping one, you're just going one hole over. Same breath. Mode. So you do <laughs> If I was doing it without the tongue blocking, you would be. You 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 have the danger that you will have play that C because it's in the in the way, and theoretically you can't play past the C without stopping the legato to some degree. You know, or, or how, you know, how did you learn to tongue block? Well, it's interesting. Uh, Charlie Layton. Let me get rid of this reverb. Uh, Charlie Layton uh, tongue blocked. There's two techniques that are distinct, but they often are confused. One is tongue blocking, where you just play the note out of the one kind of side of your mouth, like uh, blues players sometimes mm -hmm. do. And then Charlie always used one side of his mouth. I forgot whether it was left or right. It does, I really truly believe, and a lot of blues players would... Uh, say this is true, it does fatten your tone a little bit because you've got a bigger cavity in there, some resonance, you know. In, um, but great masters have not done that. Toots and Stevie, as far as I know, uh, Toots never did tongue blocking and he was as good as you can get. Uh, Charlie tongue blocked, but he didn't tongue switch. So tongue switching is different from tongue blocking. Tongue blocking is where you can play on the left side of your mouth or the right side of the mouth, and then you jump in between. And how would you recommend us to have a go at that? If not, because most of us don't um, don't tongue block. And I have to say, I've tried to learn to tongue block since having a lesson with Robert Bonfiglio yeah. and also talking to Joe Power. And I've been playing the harmonica a long time, and I still couldn't actually. I still couldn't do your tongue block. It's you know. It's an interesting thing. I'm sorry, tongue switch. I said tongue block. I mean tongue right, switch. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Um, what's funny is that, you know, there's some people can do this with their tongue. It's a mm. genetic thing. And some people can't do that. Yeah. I don't know what the percentage is, but um, I can do that. There's some people that actually play with somehow through that looped you in their tongue uh, very well. Uh, I can't do that. Uh, Randy Weinstein, who we've been talking about, Hey, Randy, if you're listening, um, he can do a flutter from one side of the tongue to the other, mm. which I can't do. It's just my tongue doesn't do that. Um, but uh, so it could be that for it's harder physically, just genetically for some reason, people to do it. Here's a nice exercise that I, that I remember when I first, this is maybe the reason I started tongue blocking, because there was a lick I wanted to play, and it just was difficult to do without tongue, tongue switching, I should switching. say. If you're in the key of C and you're playing a G dominant, so. And then uh, you, the G dominant chord. I remember Ch Charlie used to wink at me when I did that because it was something <laughs> he couldn't do, you know, because um, yeah. he didn't punch switch. Uh, but uh, I don't know who, who of the other jazz players tongue switches, but it opens up a lot of possibilities. Mm -hmm. And for me, especially if I'm playing classical stuff, which uh, like Bonfilio, uh, where you really have to, you know, it, it it makes things that would not have been legato, legato, possible to mm -hmm. do legato, because you don't have to deal with all those holes in between. You're not moving the harmonica. You're just, and and one thing is you, you, you kind of, uh, what's the word? Rotate, I suppose, the harmonica a little bit. I mean, I'll exaggerate it. You can see I'm moving the harmonica to to give it access to either the light, right side, 
my tongue is in the middle. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea of tongue switching. Right. Yeah. There's a question here, Will, from Mark Weber or Weber. Hi, Will. Do you know who of the older players you knew was using corner switching? Alan Blackie Shackner wrote about it in his Chromatic Harmonica book. What about Stan Harper? That's a very interesting question. I'm, I'm, I'm betting that Stan Harper did do it because he was a very technical, very fine musical player too, but he was very technically inclined. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I, I never asked him, but I'm quite sure he did that. Uh, Charlie did not. Um, one person who did that to great effect was John Sebastian Sr., the great uh, classical harmonica player. Mm -hmm. I think one of the finer jazz, uh, classical harmonica players that I've heard. Um, and he did that. He has a, a whole system of practicing that. In fact, I know John Sebastian Jr., who's probably maybe more famous, more known to people today or of my generation because he was the leader of the group, The Love and Spoonful. Wonderful songwriter and a uh, tremendous entertainer. And he gave me a book which had been written put together by a friend of his father's, uh, which is a, it has exercises, it has pieces, it's a big fat book. And I scanned the book and I, 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 you know what I'll do is I'll put it on my website and people can download it if they like. It's a big, a big file, but I mean, it's you know, maybe a few meg, uh, megabytes. Um, and that is filled with some wonderful uh, exercises for tongue switching and stuff like that. Right. That would yeah. be great. That would be really great to do that, Will. Yeah. Um, just to check again, is there anything I could continue to ask you questions, and I'm sure more people will ask, um, is there anything that you would like to present to us now that you prepared? Or yeah, would you like to wait a bit? I mean, we've got lots of time, but just to break things up a bit. Okay, let me just talk about what it is that I had planned to talk about. Sure, great. <laughs> talk yeah. About it or not. Um, I wanted to stress that, you know, pardon me if I do this, I'm in a creaky chair, but I like to rock. Um, being a, a jazz player, you focus on being able to improvise and the skills involved there are knowing the chords, knowing the scales of the chords, although some people do this without knowing any theory at all and play great jazz. Uh, but it certainly doesn't hurt to learn theory and uh, know your arpeggios, know your scales, know all your chords like second nature. So when someone says B flat minor seven flat five, you know exactly what's in that and you don't have to think about it. Um, and uh, and that's an endless pursuit. Um, but I, my sense was that a lot of people who play harmonica, chromatic harmonica particularly, might not want to go down that rabbit hole. You know, don't, they may not have the time or the inclination to study jazz improvisation. But everybody likes to play melodies. And I must confess, when I go to a recording studio, if somebody says, play this melody, I'm, I'm really happy. I don't have to worry that I'm going to have to impress people with a fast run or be particularly this or that. Um, it's just let, you know, just playing the melody. And I think that's a great skill that uh, singers learn because the singers, they just deal with melody. And very often in a jazz context, you'll see a singer like let's say Ella Fitzgerald and uh, uh, Joe Pass or, um, well, Ella Fitzgerald's an exception because she did improvise vocally, but uh, Billie Holiday and Lester Young um, is the classic example where she would sing and he would play, or her, her band would play choruses around and then the song would end and she would sing, sing again. Uh, and, and that's how jazz was presented traditionally, you know, um, and still is to a large degree. And uh, so singers, you know, concentrate on the melody and I noticed in the jazz uh, culture that, I, that I've, I suppose, been a part of for some time, sometimes people gave the melody short shrift. It was like something that they would uh, sort of get through so they could get to their solos. 
You know what I mean? Uh, Gasolin was where you could show your stuff. Uh, and especially if you had a trumpet pl a player and a saxophone player and a harmonica player, and they all want to play the melody at the same time, then you have to kind of play it so it's not a big mess. You all sort of play it in unison, and you play it pretty much the way it is on the sheet music, right? Um, but that works with a, with a Charlie Parker tune or a bebop tune or an up-tempo thing. Uh, but it sounds, it's a waste of a beautiful uh composition if it's if you're just playing it by yourself or playing it sometimes one of those three people would play the melody the other two would play a background line on the second a section and then in the, in the bridge some another musician would come in and play the uh the bridge and break it up that way but in any case musicians uh in ballads and, and medium tempo songs um the good players, the great players, and I'm going to give some examples of this later, uh, really play, really put thought and emotion into their presentation of the melody of the song. And as I'll show you, sometimes they stay very straight to the melody, and sometimes they take it way out. You can hardly re recognize the melody, but it's not as way out as they're going to get, because once they've played the melody, even if they embellish it in ways that you don't recognize the melody for a bar or two. Um, when they start a solo, they refer to the melody in certain ways, but very often they will start their own, uh, with their own, um, what's the word? Uh, uh, there's a musical term for it, which everybody knows, um, motifs. And they will then develop that motif, whereas the song has its own motifs, just song, a song like Yesterday, for example, by the Beatles, goes da 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 ba 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 da 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 is is a motif that is used throughout the song, and it's what pulls the composition together in many ways. So many melodies have two or three motifs, uh, but anyway, um, when playing the melody, well, I've got. Um, let me look at my notes here. Uh, well, for, for many jazz listeners who are not aficionados, the melody is kind of what they want to hear. My, my, I remember my father, happy Father's Day, um, when he used to hear me play, he'd say, Will, I, I love it when you play the melody, because he knew all those tunes, because he's 90 years old and he grew up with them. Um, he said, but, but after you play the melody, you play all, this, all these notes and you lose me. And I said, Dad, that's what jazz is, you know. Uh, you know um, and I think that you, I think people appreciate hearing a melody. And if it's an original song, hopefully they will hear the melody, retain that melody and the harmonies that are with it, so that when you improvise on it, it doesn't sound like a whole lot of boodly 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 boo. It's it's actually commenting on the melody and follow and they understand what it is you're improvising on. So all I'm saying is that stating the melody in a in a conscious way is very important. And one thing that, that I think about is it's also very good because the jazz standards, uh, as opposed to songs that were written for jazz, uh, as jazz vehicles, um, they have lyrics. And I think it's really important and advisable to know the lyrics. It gives you a sense of the tune. It gives you something to hold on to when you're doing playing the melody and even when you're soloing possibly you know uh, a song like um i mean to make an extreme example like strange fruit or uh, uh you know some very deeply moving song uh you're not going to approach with the same imp kind of improvisation as you would on billy's bounce or something you know lighter and and you know uh more technical um so anyway, so what I wanted to talk about today was melodies, how to, how to take a melody, and you can, everybody can well, read a, off the sheet music if you can read, or listen to the melody of somebody singing it and just play the melody, but how do you make it your own? And, it, and what, I wanted to, what I wanted to show is that you don't have to be an expert improviser. It's a, what it is is a doorway into improvising. If you're interested in improvising, or if you're just in, interested in playing melodies, and giving it your own personal touch, then, then playing melodies and 
working on various elements, phrasing, how are you going to phrase it? You can phrase a melody any, any way, and all of the great singers have their own way of phrasing a melody, whether it's Satin Doll or Autumn Leaves or any of this, the jazz standards or a Beatles song or a Stevie Wonder song or any other popular song. Um, you don't have to play it. So I, I did an album once where the piano player, he was producing the record, and he said, I want you to play these songs just like Ray Charles sang them. And I love Ray Charles. And you can't phrase much better than Ray Charles, but I said, I can't do that. You know, I'm not Ray Charles. I didn't grow up in a shack in Georgia, whatever. Um, I'm not going to... Um, I said, please don't ask me to do that. Let me phrase them the way I feel them. You know, uh, that's an example. And, uh, but singers always give it their own, their own phrasing. And, and jazz musicians can do the, or, or melody players can do the same. So that's, that's, you know, if I, if I don't run out of time, that's what I hope to get into here. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just look at my notes for a moment, see if there's anything I'm leaving Sure. When you're playing the melody as opposed to a solo, you want to make sure that the people know that it's the melody that they, and hopefully that they know. I think in jazz, an important thing that a lot of jazz musicians maybe forget, they get tired of playing the same 50 or 100 jazz tunes that are played all, all the time. Autumn Leaves, Satin Doll, Body and Soul, uh, In the Sentimental Mood, all those Ellington and uh, great so American songbook tunes. Um, or the Jobim uh, catalog, but um, people like to hear that because they understand then what are you improvising on and they and get excited by what you do with that chord progression that they couldn't tell you what it is, but they know it in their body. Uh, it's an interesting thing about chord progressions when when you know a song, you intuitively, everybody, it doesn't matter who they are, intuitively knows the harmony. And you could say, no, that's not possible. But think about it. If you play, happy, sing Happy Birthday and you play it on the piano, you play the right chords. If you played the wrong chords to Happy Birthday, everybody would go, no, 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 that's not right. And that's because intuitively they know what the harmony is, even though they couldn't tell you what it is. And maybe they couldn't play it on the piano, but uh, it's an interesting thing. And so people are, there are two elements, more than, there are more than two, but two of the elements in, in music, in popular music, or classical music, is melody and harmony. They go together, and they're intertwined in wonderful ways. So, um, anyway, that's a little bit about melody. Uh, one thing is, I think it's important to, to know a melody correctly. I have made albums, and played tracks on albums, where I didn't really know the melody. Not really, and there's, that's where the sheet music is really important, because the sheet music will show you how it's supposed to be played. And once you know it, you can deviate from it. But if you don't know it, you might leave out something that's really precious in that composition. Those guys were not hacks, Gershwin and <laughs> Richard Rodgers and, uh, and Paul McCartney. Those people, they put a note in there because they wanted it in there. You know, and if, if the person singing it in the Broadway play that it came to, that, that it was written for, sang the wrong note, the, the, the musical director would say, whoop, 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 that's not what Richard Rodgers wrote. You better sing that. Because they were masters at melody and harmony. So mm -hmm. uh, I used to play, this is maybe a funny story. When I was in my early 20s, I played, I had a, a gig at a place called Preachers in, in Greenwich Village. Still there under a different name. But they had music and it was very formative for me. Uh, I had a, a weekly gig and two of my favorite musicians used to come in to listen to me. One was Paul Butterfield, of all people. I guess he heard there was a, an interesting harmonica player. And at that time, I should add, there weren't a whole lot of young people playing chromatic harmonica. You know, uh, I started playing in 75 or 76. And uh, I, I, it was Mike Turk in Boston. I'm sure people know people who were playing around the world, but there was nobody really known except Toots. And so um, at that point, I, 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 I'm getting off the subject, but at that point I thought, wow, this is, and, you know, there's, there's a thousand saxophone players I can name, but I can't name many harmonicas besides, besides uh, Toots and Stevie, for example. Um, 
so uh, anyway, uh, I was playing there, and and the other musician was Jaco Pastorius, and because he lived across the street from me, and and we knew each other, and he would come in and every once in a while play, which was either a fantastic treat or a complete disaster, because he was a like Paul Butterfield was a, a person who, you know, uh, was sometimes uh, in an altered state, and um, but but I I adored both of those guys. But Paul Butterfield once beckoned me over and he said, he said, I like your playing, man. I said, thank you so much. He said, but learn the fucking melody, you know. <laughs> he didn't want to hear wrong notes in the melody when I played the melody. And as you'll hear when I play some, I'm going to play some examples of Body and Soul. It's a tune that many people know. It's a wonderful classic. And what, what I'd like to do um, now or in, in a little while is to play five melodies by different by, I, maybe I should shorten it, but three or four melodies by three different saxophone players and Toots and Charlie Layton to show how you can take the same melody in the same key at basically the same tempo and have a different take on it. And the really advanced jazz players, you, you'll see that Toots, when he did Body and Soul with Bill Evans, which I think is one of the greatest performances of... Uh, of jazz harmonica ever. I mean, Toots was such a master, musician as well as harmonica player. And uh, the notes he chooses and his phrasing and his timing and, uh, is un unparalleled. But um, he starts the melody in, in a very matter-of-fact way, but very soon he's off on, uh, on his own track. And I think for players who have played that song 10 zillion times, you know, they, they take liberties right off the bat. Uh, Charlie Layton, on the other hand, I have a recording, an informal recording where I play guitar and he plays harmonica. Uh, he played it very, very straight, but his tone and phrasing is so subtle and beautiful that it breaks your heart. So there's, a, there's everything in between. People who start with the first few notes and then go into outer space and people that stay with the melody very faithfully. So those are uh, two approaches. But people who are just getting into improvisation or want to play melodies. Oh, my, my little light went off. I had a, maybe that's okay. Okay, you guys can see me okay. Yeah. Um, uh, people that, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Uh, people, just starting, about people just starting to play, you know, or playing melodies or played mm -hmm. melodies for a long time, want to add a little spice or a little uh, personality to, the, to those melodies. Mm -hmm. A lot of it, lots of people will do that beautifully, uh, intuitively, because like singing a song when you play it. But some people st stick to the, you know, to the basic melody, and, and maybe they're shy or self-conscious about adding anything, or or they're not sure what to do. And and that's what I wanted to talk about today. What can you add to the melody? What? How can you alter the melody, uh, or subtract from the melody, to make it your own? And so, great. Right. Having said that, let's let's do a few more questions, and I'll get then I get into it. Oh, okay. Um, well, I've got a couple of interesting questions from Josh Folido, and he, he says, um, "Is Will having projects for his classical music playing like Karim Morris collaboration?" Um, it he says it's about time. He is very underrated for that genre. So well, perhaps nice. talk a bit about your classical work. I've only been doing that in the in the last five years or so, um, I started out, I've always wanted to play the Bach cello suite, um, which uh, Psy plays extraordinarily well. Uh, the, the, the harmonica player, uh, Psy, he was on, he was, I'm um, sorry, yeah. Um, and that's, oh, there it is. If you want an exercise for tongue switching, play the Bach cello suite. It's written in G, it's the one that everybody knows. Um... Et cetera, et cetera. It's a wonderful song and that is an encyclopedia of tongue switching because it basically has all the the different combinations. I mean, they're not endless. You can you can skip one 
hole, you can skip two holes, you can skip three holes, you can go from a blow to a draw, etc. Um, but there's only a, a limited number of distances you have to cover. Um, and uh, so that is a wonderful exercise. Mm -hmm. And you can, you, it, maybe I'll put it on my uh, website too, is um, you can play it in the key of G, which was originally written, which Sai plays it in beautifully, magnificently. Um, and you can also play it in the key of C, which is easier on the harmonica, and you mm -hmm. don't have to go so far down on the harmonica. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can, but you can't do it, unfortunately, on a twelve hole. You'll need a sixteen hole, mm -hmm. a, 14, a sixteen hole, which is what that. you play, Will. You know what? I play, I play the sixteen. I yeah. play. Um, this is my my fourteen hole, uh, which I really adore. It's got. You can play violin uh, repertoire because this goes down to a low G. And I find it, I actually prefer it. I just happened to have set this one up recently and it's working nicely and it's in tune. So I wanted to use it today. But very often I play with the 14 hole. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's a wonderful compromise. You get the low notes, not quite as low. Yeah. But, but uh, it's lighter, it's more manageable and, and, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, easier to manipulate. Sure. Well, um, just to interrupt you, um, it's twenty to eight here in the UK. I know. Um, I know we, we, I'm, our chairman has said we can have a bit of extra time, but I'm, I'm keen for you to do to present whatever you were going to present. You, you mentioned four or five different ways of playing body and soul. Yeah. Um, I'll just play them for you. Hopefully, it'll come. Yeah, out. that that would be great. Yeah, let's. If, I'm what sure. I'm doing is I'm playing them on my computer. They're going. <coughs> they should the come through. Okay, good. Um, yeah. What was I saying about the classical? I'm, I'm, that project with Kareem was. And I'm going to give you another disclaimer, like I did with Donald Fagan. That was a wonderful project. It was a glorious piece of music. By far the hardest thing I've ever done on the harmonica. Um, things in there that took me days to or weeks to master a phrase in that because mm -hmm. there's something really hard including the opening line there was a misunderstanding when we made that album um so uh, uh i had sent him we recorded my parts in france around the time the orchestra not at the same time as the orchestra but around the time they recorded i said kareem i can do this better so i took a rough mix of the orchestra and I took it back to New York and I spent weeks really working on it and mastering it. And I'm completely happy with what I did in New York and I'm very unhappy with what I did in France. Unfortunately, the album is what I did in France and that's what came out as uh, I just somehow Kareem didn't realize that I was sending him a whole new file of. So if you want to hear it the way I like it, on my website, if you go to willgallison.net, I believe, and you go to Odysseus Project, you will find me playing it the way I think it should be played, harmonica-wise. And the only drawback is that the orchestra is not mixed professionally because it was a rough mix of the orchestra. Mm -hmm. But there you are. But it was a, it's a wonderful piece, and I would love to do more classical harmonica. For me, it's, it's very... Uh, I'm sure Cy Young feels the same way. Um, it's nice to know what you have to play and you can, you don't have to worry about, am I going to make this change? You know, I'm going to play the right notes or anything. You know what you have to play. And it's all, once you master it, it's all about interpreting it and feeling it in the moment. And that's a great relief in a sense to a jazz mm -hmm. player. Uh, so I, I love playing classical music and I would, I hope in my golden years that I'll be doing much more of that. Uh, and have the opportunity. I would like to play with a smaller group, like a string quartet and stuff like that. Um, I think any music, any harmonica player who's done that knows how gratifying it is. Mm -hmm. So there you are. Great. So, Will, can we hear the examples you were going to play us? Yeah, let's do that. Let's get let's yeah. get to body and soul. I hope uh, most of the people here are familiar with that song. It's one of the one of the top. 20 jazz songs that people play. So if you're interested in playing jazz, storm, jazz standards or improvising, it's on the list that you need to know. Uh, I'm going to put the, if I can do this technically, I'm going to put the chart on 
so people can see the chords. Now, in the examples that I'm playing, they may not be, they're probably not the exact chords that these musicians are playing with. Um, and I, I want to mention one other thing about melodies. One of the wonderful things about that uh, program that I mentioned, iReo Pro, which you can get for about 10 or 15 bucks, uh, is that you can play any song and you can play in any key, any tempo, um, and any style, well, and many different styles. And that's a wonderful way to learn a tune intimately. If you play it as a fast samba, and then you play it as a slow ballad, and then you play it as a, some songs you can play as a waltz, even if they're in 4-4, uh, or, or vice versa. Then you really get that, that tune. And, and part, if you're playing with a group or with an accompanist, part of your making that song your own is choosing what tempo you want to play it at and what style you want to play it in and what key. You don't have to play it in the original key and very often on the harmonica the original key does not suit the song as well as it might suit a, a tenor sax or a trombone or something like that. So those are all choices and that's what this seminar is supposed to be about is what choices can you make. Not telling you what choices to make, but what kinds of choices you can make. Um, and one of them is what key you play it in, what tempo you play it in, what style you play it in. And it's a great way to, to get yourself so that you know that tune as more than just a series of notes. Okay, so having said that, uh, body and soul. I'm going to try to put this up on the screen. Give me a, tell me, uh, share screen, is that what I write? That's it, that yeah. What I push? Share yeah. screen. And another thing you can do, which is a little bit more advanced, hold shift to say, okay, so I, I, I... Make sure you share sound as well. Okay, well, right now I'm doing, yeah. Well, share sound. Well, I'm, the sound is going to be, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, can you see the... the we chart? can, that's the best view. What you have now, we can see all the chords. Okay. And you don't see me, you just see the view. That's no, fine. we can see you in a small window. Oh, good, great. Yeah. Uh, better small. Um, so, uh, let me find now my, okay, so we're going to start out with a classic version of Body and Soul by Ben Webster, and what I would, a uh, great tenor saxophone player, very old-fashioned jazz sound, you might say, very soulful, and this guy was a fan of vibrato. His sound is characterized by a deep vibrato, uh, and a very sensitive way of playing notes on the saxophone, uh, which I think is a little bit lost in today's world where people tend to blow their brains out on the, on the, on a tenor sax. So listen to how soulfully and, and anyway, see, here's Ben Webster playing body and soul. Hopefully it will play. <laughs> Oh, 
version. Uh, Charlie Parker is he's known for playing very fast. He's probably the most famous jazz Wait. saxophone. Yeah, there's Charlie Parker. I, I love that recording because it's so intimate. He's playing with just a guitar player who's doing chink, 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 chink. And he's such a wonderful improviser. And I would imagine that's a very early recording. Maybe he was in his 20s. Um, but it, it's that's, a, that's another one. Here's John Coltrane playing the same thing. John Coltrane is very different from uh, Ben Webster. And you'll hear he hardly uses any vibrato at all. And he's much more aggressive and less romantic but very soulful. So that's the, I'm not going to play the whole thing. That's his take on the first two A sections of Body and Soul. Now I would like to play for you two versions of Toots Thielman playing it. This first one is an old one. And he's, you can hear he's playing in a much more European style, like a, almost like a, a gypsy style. Uh, this is, I believe, with George Shearing. Um kind of a gypsy jazz thing and, and where are you Tuts? Here it goes. <laughs> Thank you. 
is our man, Toots. And here he is with Bill Evans, very different approach, probably 30 years later. On this one, he, he starts with the melody and very quickly goes off. So that's Toots playing the, uh, yeah, I, I think that's a marvelous performance of harmonica. Yeah. Whenever I hear Toots, I just think, mm. holy smokes. Yeah. How, how well, he is as a I'm musician. sorry to interrupt you. We, we mm. need to bring the session to a close. Oh, what a I'm shame. sure we could go on for another hour or two because this has been so absolutely fascinating. So many things have been like the iceberg pointing to some greater huge discussion and it's been uh, it's been wonderful to for all of us i think to get a sense of just the amount of experience that you've got and um you know the different things you've had the the, the generosity with which you've shared different parts of your experience and tips and so on it's been a really brilliant session and um so i'm um, thank you so much on behalf of harmonica uk and i would you know it, it's 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 just great and you know if you've had to spend 15 months in puerto rico hanging out and taking a break Costa totally rico. welcome and you've earned it and like sonny rollins took two years out maybe you'll start playing under brooklyn bridge to get back in and come back even better so um i wish you really well um i hope you know maybe there'll be opportunities in the future for you to do some more stuff w with harmonica uk but this has been a fantastic fantastic session Great. so um adam, yes, i will now hand over to our chairman pete oh don't go away adam please um but oh, sorry no no we were talking maybe about uh, me taking some questions from people in the other in the green room or something like that is yeah. that still on or are we out of time if you're up for it well that'd be wonderful that's my next question so perhaps 100%. and we'll go to the green room briefly afterwards but um 
Could I just say, this has been another extraordinary masterclass, and having two jazz legends there presenting is wonderful. And I realised a few minutes in that everything that's been said was a golden nugget to hang on to and listen to. You know, particularly about the, you know, the hunting down the melody exactly. You know, something I'm guilty of. And it's a really fantastic um, uh, pr presentation. Mm. Um, Thank you. But um, if I can ask everyone who's in the, in the room still to give a, a huge Harmonic UK thanks, a show of hands, please, to, to Adam and to Will for a, gr a great session. So thanks so much indeed. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Will. Thank yeah. you. And uh, we'll come see you in the, in the green room in a minute. So uh, if you guys want to go to the green room, we'll join you in a second. I'm just going to close down the rest of the festival.